Hi, everyone. Welcome to the LATAM Stocks Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Flood. Today, I'm speaking with Ian Bezik. Ian's an investor and an analyst. He runs the Ian's Inside Corner newsletter on Seeking Alpha and Substack. He regularly covers Latin American companies and their economies. It's also one of my favorite Twitter accounts to follow. He regularly posts tickers related to Latin America and insights about Latin American companies. So we have a ton of ground we want to cover today. We're going to kind of do like a 2024 Latin American preview episode and see what Ian's thinking for the markets he follows in Latin America. So yeah, ton of ground to cover. So let's do it. Hey, Ian, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for the invite. Been looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, me too. Like I said, you're one of my favorite accounts to follow on Twitter because there's just not that many investors and analysts that regularly post Latin American companies on Twitter for whatever reason. And you're one of them. And I think you have great content. So before we go you know, country by country, can you tell me a little more about your background and where you're from? How'd you end up living in Colombia and following Latin markets? Yeah, sure. So just out of college, I got a degree in economics, publishing investment ideas online through Seeking Alpha. And a hedge fund reached out to me and liked some of my work and said, hey, you should do an internship with us at our fund in New York. And that turned into a full-time gig for a few years. But I realized kind of over time, I didn't like living kind of the, the hedge fund lifestyle. I saw a lot of my older co-workers who were just... That wasn't really the life path I wanted to be on, trying to hustling in the city with the long hours and everything costing three times as much as it should. So I saved up enough money to go traveling. I was just traveling in South America for a year, met my wife, and just never went back to the U.S. So So did you have like a a professional or investment interest in Latin America before you traveled there or kind of you traveled, you've been there and you follow what's around you? I think I was just kind of seeing that there was very little coverage of those companies. I'm kind of in the New York or London media. I figured there might be an opportunity to kind of carve out a niche for myself, just covering some stuff that was off of most people's radar. And obviously, since we've had this long bear market in Latin America, it remains an uncrowded opportunity. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's crazy, too, because for the size of you know just South America together, it's a huge market, like economically speaking. There's huge economies. There's plenty of companies, private market stuff, and for whatever reason, underfollowed. I don't know. Why do you think? Do you have any theories why no one seems to care about Latin American equities? Yeah, I think price drives uh, behavior more than anything. And most of our regional markets peaked somewhere between call it 2008, 2012. So 10 years of stocks being flat or going down. Plus, just kind of the, the idea that these are just commodity markets. And people don't really understand that now in Brazil, you have a lot of tech financial companies coming out of there that are interesting. In Mexico, you have this industrial wave, and yet people still think it's just mining and farming, which that's fine. I mean, there's value in those too, but these economies have more going on than maybe outsiders give it credit for. Yeah, I feel like too, you know, it's still older generations that control the wealth in the US and London. And I think a lot of investors kind of think of political risk from Latin America of like the 80s and the 90s. Like I think Colombia is still kind of like they they associate with Pablo Escobar and they still think of Brazil as like a military dictatorship. And I think a lot of people haven't updated to the risks politically like today, jurisdictionally, because they're not the same jurisdictions. What do you think? I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Right on. (laughs) Okay, cool. So let's, let's do the preview. We'll start by asking, you know, Colombia, you live there, you know it as well as anybody. What do you expect moving into next year for Colombia? Yeah, so I've lived here, my wife's Colombian, and I traveled here the first time in 2014, studied Spanish at a university here for a while, and then moved back with my wife in 2018 when we got married. So I've been here the past, was that, six years now, time flies. Um, so this has been my home base. But yeah, it's a decent perspective. If nothing else, I've lived through quite a few years of the cycle, including through the pandemic. Fairly upbeat for this next year. Obviously, the big shock was last year when the left-wing uh, president, Gustavo Petro, won the presidency for the first time in the modern constitution era in the 1990s on. That was the first time a left-winger had won in Colombia. And people kind of just, I don't know how many obituaries I read for the country that just said, oh, it's the next Chavez, the next Venezuela. But as it turns out, 30 years of having a strong constitution and independent institutions has created quite a bit of of institutional strength. And so the president hasn't been able to overhaul everything. He hasn't been able to act like a dictator. The Supreme Court has struck down 
I don't know how many rulings it's every month the Supreme Court's breaking down something else. And then kind of the big turning point was in October. We had elections for all the governorships and mayorships across the country. And the president's party won just two out of 32 states. And you had conservatives win in places like Bogota for the first time in ages, like in my department, which I think went, what, 70% for Petro in the general election, uh, but voted for conservatives for the local elections this time. So it's like the country has swung hard back to the right. What, uh, what can- which makes me wonder, like, how much... What's that? I was going to ask, like, what changed so quickly to make him so unpopular? Because, right, you just said they went one seventy percent, and now I see videos of stadiums of people booing him during football games. I mean, how do you, how did he do that that quickly? Oh yeah, and just to clarify, that was, he won seventy percent in my department, which is one okay. of the most liberal departments in the country. But somehow he went from that to not being able to win local elections a year right. later. But I think what happened is kind of if you'd had conservatives in power forever, they kind of mismanaged the pandemic locally. Mm. Unemployment was very high. And so I think there was backlash, as we've seen in a lot of countries, to how the government handled the pandemic. And people may have interpreted an anti-COVID vote as being this sweeping endorsement of socialism, whereas it turns out the electorate was just mm. really tired of the old government. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. But, that makes sense. Yeah, we've seen, I think we've seen similar shifts in a lot of South American countries where you've had decisive election results seemingly in one direction and then a year or two later things go back the other way yep so what do you think for equities and economically then for colombia i mean it's one of the most undervalued markets in latam right like the equity market do you think it gets a bid and maybe valuations start to rise a little or do you think it just stays perpetually undervalued yeah, so I think not just latin america using some of the cape data which i know some people kind of argue over whether that's useful or not. But I saw that Colombia was the cheapest market in the whole world based on on <laughs> Cape okay. valuations. Yeah, I think obviously the overhang is you have a self avowed socialist president who is in power until 2026. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. people probably aren't going to be in a rush to bid stuff up. Mm-hmm. That said, he's clearly lost his political mandate. His approval ratings are in the 20s. He lost so many Congress, so much of his coalition in Congress. And so... I don't know how far before, when you have a lame duck president who's still going to be in power for a long time, at what point do people stop complaining about the lame duck and start saying, hey, things could get a lot better here once there's a new administration. The other major concern, oil is about half of Colombia's exports, give or take 10% any given year. And so things look a lot better here if oil's at 100, like it was two months ago, rather than 70 where it is today. And so that dials back my enthusiasm a little bit. You've got like the dominant banks here typically have sold for one and a half, two times book value. And now they're like 0.7 times book value and they're generating record profits at the moment. So usually as businesses profits go up, they should at least support their old valuation ratio. And instead, but yeah, like our flagship banks, 14% dividend yields. That's not like aggressive. It's if you trade it four times earnings and you pay out half your earnings as dividends, that's how you get a 14% dividend yield. So I don't think Colombian stocks would drop in 2024. It's just a question of if we get paid primarily through the dividend or if they start to finally revalue. Okay, that's reasonable. So you mentioned oil, and one of the favorite tickers on Twitter is Echo Petroleo, EC. And I know you follow it closely. So what are your expectations for them in you know maybe a $70, $80 barrel oil for next year? Yeah, the profits will be down a little bit versus last year, just full year 2023 versus full year 2022. And then I'd assume pretty similar given where oil is now. That said, I'd remind listeners that they own 100% of refining capacity in the country. Like all of the gasoline, jet fuel and whatnot is processed through them. They own most of the pipelines. They bought most of the electrician transmission system for power utilities off of the government. Um, They own toll roads. So there's a lot of business there that's not just the price of oil. And then the actual oil part of the business barrels in the 30s. And so it's like... Would they be happier if the price is 90 rather than 70? Sure. But I think when you're paying four times earnings as your starting point and you own kind of monopoly assets, like literally 100% of the countries you're finding, but that, that gives you a significant margin of safety. So Petro, President Petro, uh, the socialist tried to raise the royalty taxes on oil production, but the Supreme Court struck that down as unconstitutional. So that was a nice win for shareholders recently as well. Do you have any idea why... Foreign investors seem so interested in the oil 
majors in Latin America, like EC and Petrobras, I seem to get the most engagement, anything I post about them. And I'm curious if you know why. Is it just oil prices have been up, so oil companies are popular, or, or do you have any theories? Then with YPF as well, and Argentina is the most popular Argentine tech crew too. So Which one? Confirming your idea. YPF. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I'm curious, because like, I've noticed that, that uh, the oil companies, for whatever reason, seem to be by far the most popular. Like You won't get nearly the engagement on a Valley post as you will on a Petrobras post. And curious if you have yeah, theories. I think... You have large market caps. Yeah, I don't know in Brazil for Petrobras, but in Colombia, EC is the largest company here by market cap. So just there's a lot of trading liquidity and volume there. And then they've been listed for a long time. And so people are familiar with them. Like people that have been trading for a long time could have been trading them back in the 2000s. Like I think right. YPF in particular did very well under the first Lula government, right? So probably people have a lot of yeah. kind of muscle memory of that. True. True. So what else? Is anything else worth talking about for Colombia next year before I jump to another country? Um, yeah, I think it's just interesting because it's like you said, it's the deepest value of the region, but there's harder to come up with a direct catalyst. Like the country's primary source of export funding oil isn't looking so great at the moment. I don't think anyone's going to come rushing to buy our stuff until there's a clear kind of view of how the Petro government ends and uh, what happens with the next elections and uh, yeah and so it's just like does something change in the market that causes people to look at, at these companies at four and five times earnings and double digit dividend yields and say hey this is worth the risk or right. or do they just kind of trade flat again this year like they did last year <laughs> but flat might not be bad like echo patrol i believe is up i believe the stock is up 10 percent this year but it paid a 26 percent dividend and so it actually turned out to a 40 percent total return this year which if you're wanting to bet on oil and oil's flat and echo patrol produces a 40 percent return that works out right? true do you think is m a in colombia common amongst major companies i know this year one of the stocks i followed multi or group of nutressa sorry confused it but they got taken out by an american billionaire right like and that was a pretty big acquisition for colombia so is that kind of an anomaly or is that something you think you might see more of but yeah by a colombian billionaire but there was outside oh, he was colombian uh, okay left. okay yeah but no, that was actually, that fight was going on for several years before he finally won. And so that was very interesting because it was the first real kind of value investor taking aim at our market. Our market's been dormant for many years. Like as a funny result of that, like at one point he was taking a run at our big insurance company and the insurer was trading at 0.4 times book value. And so the insurance company launched a buyback. I had to publish like ads in the newspaper explaining what a buyback was to Colombians just because <laughs> like nobody does buybacks in Colombia. That's crazy. They're like, this is why we're doing it and this is why it's good for you. <laughs> But it's just kind of the, the U.S. activist shareholder playbook has not been uh, utilized in Colombia. And yeah, so, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll see more in MA. There's a lot of large private companies that just have no interest in listing in Colombia because our stock market has been a disaster for a decade. But I don't know. Once prices go up, maybe you see more IPOs and more activity. Yeah, yeah. I think I agree. So let's jump to Mexico then. Uh, we talked on Twitter couple months ago and we mentioned the election next year in mexico so i'm mm -hmm. curious if you have an opinion i know you follow the election stuff pretty closely in the markets like have you handicapped it at all do you have any idea what's going to happen next year in mexico with the election yeah i mean looking at the polls now the the hand-picked successor to emma is running like 20 points ahead in the polls which is Obviously not where one would want to start out an election cycle. I'd said, I would point out that at this point in the election cycle six years ago, Emma was even in the polls and he ended up winning by 32. So uh, <laughs> things can move quite a bit. You just finally had them um, kind of settle on the last two candidates, like the field finally cleared up over this past week. Yeah, and so I think after the new year, you'll start seeing them campaign in earnest and we'll start seeing if the conservative coalition can come up with any real opposition or not. I don't think Gamble has been terrible for stocks. I say that as someone who is my largest positioner in the airports, and he kind of got punched mm -hmm. us last quarter. But overall, he's been friendly to manufacturing. He's been friendly to tourism. Mexico has more FDI foreign direct investment coming in now than ever. Mexico has overtaken China as the U.S.'s largest trade partner. I think kind of contrarian populism is not the worst politics in the world. 
I mean, he's not my cup of tea, but he's certainly not. You could do much worse by Latin American left wing president standards. Yeah, so. yeah my, been... my view on Mexico is not nearly as binary left wing bad, right wing good. I think the right wing has been pretty underwhelming in Mexico. You had many years of conservative rule where the GDP hardly grew at all. Yeah, yeah. So I don't view the election as nearly as important as probably most other people do. Yeah, I mean, what I follow most in Mexico is the mining stocks, and he's been pretty brutal on the mining industry. And they're like that is 30, true. Yeah. they're 30, 35 percent of like silver production, and you can't even basically can't even open a new mine. So he's been pretty brutal there too. But yeah, I don't know. I'd be curious to see. So you mentioned the FDI, and one of the big narratives I see debated is the nearshoring narrative in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I've seen you post a few times about it. I know you follow Mexico. So what are your thoughts? Is that happening? Where is it happening? What type of companies? Who benefits? Curious for your thoughts. You are totally right on mining, on lithium, on natural resources, and on energy. He's been very bad. It's kind of my assumption in general is that left-wingers just don't invest in natural resources when you have a left-wing government in power. <laughs> and yeah. so... I was fortunate enough to not be involved there. But like I said, he came from my airports and they, they dropped very hard and then they came back very hard. It's a different story. On FDI, yeah, I mean, I think it's very clearly happening. You can look at supply chain data, for example, the Wall Street Journal ran a piece earlier this year that the number of Mexican firms that have been exporting to the U.S. has more than doubled since the pandemic. Meanwhile, that figure has gone down sharply for China. Yeah, just the amount of new factories. I was posting them on Twitter for a while, and I figured people would be getting bored. But it was like every <laughs> two or three weeks, there was some big new factory going in in one Twitter. It would be like Hershey one week, be Procter & Gamble a few weeks after that. Obviously, they got the $5 billion Tesla plant, which in turn should cause a lot of other like suppliers to Tesla to also want to build their, like a steel company announced a $2 billion plant, presumably to make more steel for all the new cars they'll be making there. So you get kind of these network effects just as one or two big investors come into a region, or one or two big factories, excuse me, then you need a lot of other supply chain, like packaging. There's a lot of packaging investment in Mexico now because companies had been buying Mexican companies. Like I was talking to someone from Hershey, Mexico, and she said they just gotten overwhelmed because they bought all their packaging from China and they had like, this huge demand in the U.S., but they just didn't have any cardboard. And so their factory shut down and said, so like, okay, fine, we're only going to buy packaging from Mexico now because we can't have that happen again. Logistics has been another huge one that's been kind of the trucking industry and warehouses are a huge growth sector right now. You just had an IPO for a logistics, Mexican logistics company in the U.S. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it makes more sense to me culturally. Like, why would the U.S. be buying this stuff from China where they can do it in Mexico or even like Colombia, like a company like Technoglass? Like that business model made sense to me because it's clearly cheaper to manufacture the same stuff in Colombia. And then instead of across the Pacific, you know, in the Caribbean, it's right there. But so you think that's going to persist into 2024, 2025, the near shore, and you think but like the the incremental investments now that they need to build up like packaging, logistics and stuff. That trend continues, even though maybe the factories have already started to be built. Yeah, I think over time, Mexico will expand its lead on China in terms of mm. how much of U.S. trade is with Mexico and how much is with China. That would be, if my thesis is correct, Mexico will keep growing its lead. And if I'm wrong, then you'll see China regain share against Mexico. But that would be the thing to watch. But I think Mexico can take share for quite a while. Interesting. So you just watch FDI for that? You watch the export numbers to track it? Yeah, and then and then I do, I got a Google News alert for factory, uh, for just like investments, okay. kind of when people are announcing new factories. That's kind of the leading indicator when a company announces a new factory, then in like six months, 12 months, you'll see new jobs, you'll see people moving into those states. I think most people probably don't appreciate just the scale of the internal migration within Mexico. You've had a lot of southern Mexico and a lot of Central America move to northern Mexico to get jobs. Monterey, for example, its population is great, 75,000 people a year, which is just, you run those numbers, it was like 1.2 million, 1.4 million people when NAFTA was approved, and now it's like 5.5 million people. It's just, it's, crazy, it's been right? an incredible run. And they're moving there because there's jobs, right? Like they're moving there because it makes sense. Exactly. Sense. Yeah, they're paying on average, I believe, four fifty uh, USD per hour to their manufacturing employees, which in Mexico is a pretty good wage. Certainly, if you're someone living in the poor southern part of Mexico or in Guatemala, you look at that and say, "Hey, but might go up there." 
and right. build something for, for my family. So you mentioned the airports, and I know you follow them closely. So I want to ask you, I guess we'll talk about the airports, definitely. But what do you think about Mexican tourism in general? Some of the most hate I've ever gotten was when I talk trash on Brazilian tourism industry, right? Because they get like no tourists for the size of the country, and they just wildly underperform. So when you look at like the actual tourism in Latin America, like Mexico blows everybody out of the water in terms of tourist arrivals. Like they get like 20 plus million. And then the next is maybe like Brazil with six. So do you think Mexico just continues to dominate Latin American tourism? Yeah, I mean, a huge part of that is just proximity. Like if you live in Texas or you live in California, it's like a two or three hour direct flight to Mexico. Yeah. Whereas yeah, I don't know the exact flight times to Brazil, but like anytime I try to get to Peru or Argentina or something, it's uh, it's a huge headache from the U.S. Yeah, like a huge chunk of the industry is actually Canada as well, like Canada and Mexico tourism, because you've got Canadian discount carriers that have their direct flights to Puerto Vallarta and whatnot. So yeah, proximity is a huge part of it, but then Mexico has been very friendly to tourism. It's very easy. They don't really require visas for many developed countries. You can stay for 180 days. That's in contrast to like Brazil. They're charging, Brazil's charging reciprocity now, right? They, like $160. They, to they, they change it. They had it. I've had like seven visas to Brazil in my 10 years. So like, yeah, <laughs> they had it and then Bolsonaro got rid of it. And then they were going to bring it back, but then they delayed it because the system wasn't ready. And now apparently it's an e-visa in January, but they're just making it up as they go along pretty much, which doesn't attract tourists when it's a 10 hour flight thousand dollars round trip like who's going to sign up for that if you don't even know what the paperwork and the cost is right yeah wait when i went to bolivia i couldn't even figure out how to apply for a visa online and so i was like <laughs> literally at the peru border like walking like through this small town in peru to find the bolivian consulate office it's just this like one dude and they're like oh he's out to lunch so you're waiting for like two hours to go see this one guy who's running the office so you can pay them 160 dollars for your visa to go into bolivia it's like uh, no wonder there are more people going they, to Bolivia. They used to, they prosecuted like four people at the Brazilian consulate in New York one time because you used to have to pay with uh, U.S. like post office checks. And apparently they, they were just buying like steak dinners with them and stuff. <laughs> so, wow. But yeah, I don't know. I can't stand the reciprocity stuff doesn't make sense to me. The Latin American countries that do it because it's like, you know, cool. The U.S. charges for a visa and you need to get a visa, but the U.S. doesn't need your tourism, right? Like. No one notices if all the Brazilians stop showing up for tourism, but like the Latin American countries can benefit by attracting tourism. I mean, look at El Salvador, right? Like their tourism is up like 30% year over year on good internet marketing. And like, it makes a difference, right? When your economy is like El Salvador's, it can make a huge difference. And none of that happens if they had reciprocity. 100%, I agree. Uh, I was just going to comment, yeah, the one negative risk I see to Mexico's tourism, ironically, is if the economy is too strong, so that would make the peso go up. Mm and decrease the competitiveness compared to the Caribbean or to Central America. I think, what, the peso hit 25 during the pandemic, and now it's back up to, like, 17. It's been the world's strongest currency since election night 2016, <laughs> when Trump won. Like, if you bought pesos at that point, the peso's up 20% since then, and you've made, and you've been getting paid, like, 8% a year on Mexican CDs. It's like, yeah. peso's been the world's strongest currency, which is wonderful for Mexico, like, Mexican citizens people that live there but it will put a drag on tourism at some point if the peso stays strong like this whereas you can travel in countries like colombia where the currency is getting bombed out for sure yeah there was a slight uproar when the peso i think it hit like 16 or 17 right and all the the tourists that had moved there like oh, this isn't cheap anymore yep exactly i lived in mexico for three years because my wife did her phd program in mexico Fun tip, if you speak Spanish the Mexican gov and you got good grades in undergrad, the Mexican government will give you a PhD like for free. So like they, they just accept you. Like the, PhD, the PhD program is free. Like she applies, they get in, and then she just goes and does her PhD and it was free. Yeah. I think it was because of science, because she's a biologist, so probably not for yeah. some other degree paths. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. but anyway, so yeah, we lived in Mexico for three years thanks to that. But yeah, when I was living there, it was like 19 to 20 for the peso, and now it's, what, 17, so... Okay. It was cheap when it was 20 in 2016, but I imagine it's not nearly as cheap now. Where in Mexico did you live? We lived in Querétaro, which is like two hours north of Mexico City. Okay, cool. You liked it? Like it was a, it was a cool place to live? Yeah, very quiet. It's another one of the industrial boom towns because it's, mm -hmm. it's like the head of their aerospace industry. It was 400,000 people in the 1980s and now it's 2 million. Whoa. What was that, 5X? 
in 30 years. That's wild. And yeah, I don't know if this is true anymore, but when I was living there, there were more Japanese people than there were Americans. Like the Japanese were the largest expat community just because so many of their car and their aerospace companies had set up. And so I had to bring over some executives to to keep tabs on what their employees were up to. That's crazy. Yeah, I saw it. But yeah, it was like you look around, there's skyscrapers, but there's like 20, 30 story buildings. You've got maybe the 25% of their population that lived in the US at some point. Like they have direct flights from that airport to Texas now. So people can just go back and forth to see their family. It's like people that haven't lived there just don't understand how close these cultural ties are. Like I could go to a bar like on a Sunday and watch football with like Mexicans that were very into like the Dallas Cowboys. You just wouldn't expect it unless you flipped it. Yeah. It makes sense too, right? There's so many Mexicans living in the U S there's so much cross-cultural blending or whatever you want to call it. I think it helps take business from Vietnam, India, China, like if you're like a manufacturing Mm -hmm. company and you're thinking about where to put your next plant and you already know, like you have a bunch of Mexicans that work at your plant, they have strong cultural affinity for the U.S. and people travel back and forth all the time. And, and what, Dallas to Monterey is an hour on a plane? Like, why don't you put your plant? In near shore and like culturally, that's exactly what I meant when I was a kid. Even Mexico for sure is probably the most culturally integrated with the U.S., but just Latin American in general, I would say, has way more in common culturally with the U.S. than it does Asia. Right. So like yeah. American companies generally do better. Argentina or, or Colombia, right? Ecuador's dollarized already. Like I think it always kind of baffled That's me right. why, why American companies were so focused on Asia when Latin America seems like a low hanging fruit. But yeah. Anyway, yeah, back to the I think, the I was just gonna say I think it was a, just a matter of population because you had yeah. such a large labor force available in China, Vietnam, a couple of other countries. But now kind of the Wages have gone way up in China compared to where they were 30 years ago. And kind of their demographics aren't nearly as good, like China, South Korea, kind of all those countries have very, very low birth rates. And so there's just much less available labor at very low prices than there was like 30 years ago. So now people are saying, hey, if, if there isn't nearly as cost competitive, so I think it's like $6 an hour for average Chinese manufacturing labor now. Whereas it was like pennies when the right. companies got there 30 years ago. And so now if you're looking at it, you're saying, oh, it's $6 in China, it's $4 in Mexico, it's two fifty in Colombia. Now the math changes quite a bit. Right. And, and you should be able to get it from Mexico to the U.S. cheaper than China to the U.S. too. So it's cheaper labor and should be cheaper logistics, you would think. But yeah, back to the peso though. I saw this amazing chart this morning, actually, and it showed the Japanese yen carry trade for the Brazilian rei and the Mexican peso. And it showed it since the beginning of 2021 versus the NASDAQ. And that carry trade for those two currencies just blown the NASDAQ out of the water for three years, which it blew my mind to look at. Like I knew real rates were high in both countries, but then you see how it actually outperformed. It's been pretty crazy because usually I don't associate currency strength with Latin America, but it has been. Yeah, I think we may be entering a new era. Like I said, with Mexico has actually been the world's strongest major like tradable currency for years now and some of the other ones have performed reasonably well brazil like you said even countries like peru their currencies have done fairly well since the pandemic when you have the backdrop that you get much higher interest rates like mexico's bank rate is 11 percent colombia is paying 13 percent on deposits and so like as long as the exchange rate like if the exchange rate is flat and you earn 13 percent on your deposits you do well and if it actually goes up then (laughs) then you're really cooking (laughs) yeah yeah exactly Back to your airports then and Mexico tourism. So what are your expectations for the airports and tourism in general in 2024? Up? Like more tourist arrivals? You think these businesses are going to do well in 2024? Are they past the government scare? I didn't follow that that closely, but I remember that they took a beating on some announcements. So what do you think? Yeah, so just on the day we're recording this, the 14th, uh, the news came out uh, last night that the government kind of re-upped one of their contracts for Sureste, uh, ticker ASR, kind of with no changes from the last five-year agreement. And so Sureste is up like 21% today, and the other two are up 15%. So just adding that context, because I don't know what time people will be listening to this. But yeah, so the scare was the government just announced that they were unilaterally changing the contracts, which whenever, anytime people hear unilaterally changing contracts in Latin America, they assume like communism and 
all the stuff's getting stolen. <laughs> but then, like, a few days later, like, the first release comes out, it's like, hey, we're, we're looking at, like, 5 to 8% changes in the contracts, which is not ideal, but it's a fire cry from the stocks were down 40% just on the word unilateral changes. And then once once cooler heads prevailed, kind of people say, no, oh, this is no big deal. As it turns out, the government gave concessions, probably the wrong way, the government gave some cost savings to the airports in 2020, kind of as compensation for the airports mm. being closed and for far fewer tourism, uh, far fewer tourists. So this merely rolls back their profits to where they were before they got the COVID benefits. And so I think if it had been presented as the government doesn't want you earning windfall profits from the pandemic anymore, since we're going into 2024 already, no one would have complained about that, but it's just horribly messaged by the government. Interesting. But whatever, like the leading airport group was 200 and then it fell to like 102 and today it's back to like 165. So yeah, okay. close to the way back there. But to the other part of your question, what's my outlook for 2024? My general view is the economy slowing down. I think we're past the peak of the tourism reopening. And actually, the tourism numbers have been really weak in Mexico the past few months, like Cancun is rolling over. So I'm more optimistic for the airports that are industrial focused. The cities like Monterey that I was talking about, where that city, I mean, just traffic is going to go up every year just because you have more people living there and you have more stuff going on there. So like the big cities, Guadalajara is growing very quickly. Be bullish on that one. But yeah, I think 2024 is kind of a return to trend year rather than kind of this boom that we've been having for the past couple of years. It's a like longer term, I think, through, well, through 2030, I think the airports can grow traffic at maybe 8% a year, let's say, average. And the gross EBITDA at about 15% because typically they, they get about $2, two EBITDA dollars per unit of revenue growth. So I think if you look at the starting multiples, like, nine times I believe we are at today and like 12 times earnings you figure 15 percent growth after that numbers look pretty good Ooh. and then their balance sheets are pretty healthy i mean there's no like leverage risk or anything i think they're fine for they're all under one time debt to ebitda and they have the highest credit rating in, that you can get as a mexican company nice nice yeah. what about what about the other you follow any of the other airport companies there's one in argentina too right or yeah, I own the one in Argentina, and then there's a couple more that I kind of follow that are outside of Latin America. So. But yeah, for people that are interested, airports are kind of a global industry. They just aren't publicly traded in the U.S. for whatever reason. But there's European airports, Australia, New Zealand. If you find them interesting, they, they're available, just not in the U.S. Um, but yeah, I really like the Argentinian company. It's 60% of the revenue and profits are from Argentina, and then... I think 10% is Brazil, 10% is Italy, and then the other 20% is everything else. It was trading at a preposterously low valuation because people had just kind of assumed it was an Argentine business, so it wasn't worth anything. But <laughs> at one point during the pandemic, you could have paid 10 times even for the Italian business and gotten the other 90% of the company for free. <laughs> how bad things were <laughs> at one point. But yeah, I think, I think the outlook is very bright now with the new government. I think you'll see them open up a lot of uh, stuff to outside investment. You'll probably have a lot more tourists coming through to check out the new operating environment there. And then the new president, Malay, was the chief economist for this airport company. That was his private sector job before he became president. And so if there was anyone better to push the, <laughs> the benefits of private infrastructure in a country, it would probably be that firm's chief economist. For sure. I'm very eager to see how we can do in terms of marketing. It's kind of the air, airline industry. He wants to privatize. Argentina has a state-run airline that yeah, is was expensive and gives poor service. And he's already said that he's planning to privatize that. And he's going to open it up so that like the Brazilian and Colombian and whatever airlines can fly, like even domestic flights within Argentina to compete more broadly. So one would assume traffic volume should go up a lot over the next four years. Yeah, I think I saw a headline where he tried to give it to the airline union. Like he said, okay, here, just take That's it. That's correct. And the, the union said, you <laughs> yeah. don't want this. <laughs> so do, do you know, how did that actually play out? So did they actually fully reject it? And then now he's going to open it up to bids? I don't think, I could be wrong here, but I don't think anything's finalized yet. I think it was just, okay. that was kind of a rhetorical flourish where they were complaining. It's like, well, funny, I mean, think this is such a great business. I'd be happy to give it to you. It's like, <laughs> oh no, we don't want it because it's actually worthless. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, but, it's uh, yeah. There's still not a lot of policy clarity on Malay's government just because he just took power last week, and right. pretty much as you probably know, in most of Latin America, nothing happens between about now and the middle of January. Car- carnival, <laughs> it's it's carnival, carnival. It's carnival in Brazil. Yeah. Nothing happens. So depending on after yeah. the carnival holiday, because the five day weekend is is when the Brazilian year starts. But uh, yeah. So. What else do you think for Argentina then? I guess, are you watching anything in particular, like a policy change that would would trigger interest in a certain industry for you? Or is there any way you're playing it? Uh, I bought a basket of Argentine, just pretty much everything that I thought was decent quality that had a U.S. ticker symbol back okay. in 2020 when everything was really bombed out. People just couldn't imagine like everything's ever going right again like it was early in the socialist government's time there just prices were very very low and at the time i bought it i said i don't know when this is going to pan out but historically argentine equities have have had adequate investor protections like you don't get wiped out during the down cycles like there's rule of law and so if you buy a basket at very low prices eventually they'll pan out since then some of those are up 50 percent. some of those are up 300%. It's been kind of a crap shoot, but the baskets worked very well. I haven't taken any other aggressive positions, like airport companies, ticker CAP is by far my largest position there. That's kind of my big, big exposure to Argentina, but I still have my basket that will, that will appreciate if things go up. Um, To the other part of your question, what am I looking for? I think the biggest question is just how does Malay face all the opposition that he's going to have to Mm. his economic agenda? Can he actually dollarize, or are they going to use a peg to the peso? Um, what does he do? Like, can he actually fire all those state employees? I think within three to six months, we'll have a very good idea of whether he can actually make most of what he's talking about happen. Like, if there's going to be radical change, shock capitalism, or if there's going to be incremental change. But yeah, it's very, from my perspective, it's very hard to predict because if he's successful, this will be kind of the biggest economic overhaul. I think we've seen anywhere since maybe like Poland and Czechoslovakia in like 1992. That's kind of the model of like countries that are exiting the Soviet Union and went yeah. like hardcore straight into capitalism. And that ultimately worked out well. But you, on the other hand, you could argue that with special circumstances and will an Argentine electorate give Malay as much as much room to, to work the system as kind of like Poland, like the government had total free reign to do whatever it wanted there because people were sick of 70 years of communism. So I'm not sure the Argentine electorate is up for quite as much of a wild ride. Yeah. I don't know. Like I said, my degrees in economics, I'm very curious to see how this plays out. It's one of the biggest experiments we've seen in decades. Yeah. I was surprised he won. Honestly, like I would have just just bet on the other guy if you asked me a year ago, was the left wing guy or the right wing guy going to win in Argentina? So the fact that he won. It's kind of surprising. Handy I guy. remember writing to my subscribers early this year, like that I thought he had a one in three chance of winning, and then that I realized that that sounded crazy because obviously people aren't going to elect to elect this guy. But like when you actually looked at the polling and you looked how upset people were, it's like he's got a chance. So I'm bullish on Argentina because I think he's got a one in three chance of winning. But even like to me, it's like the idea that he actually pulled it off is incredible. Yeah, especially after the first round. But like, sometimes thought- the markets. The- yeah, because uh, he underperformed in the first round. Yeah. Sometimes in markets, you get paid for betting on an event that is unlikely, but has a higher chance of happening than people expect. So like, if people have been assigning it a 5% chance, and my assumption was a 33% chance, then there's still a positive value in betting on that. Yeah, I think the other thing I'm watching for closely is to see what he does with mining in particular, because Argentina's got these huge deposits of lithium and copper. In Western Argentina, yep. and you know, copper, for example, in, in Panama, they just shut down, you know, over one percent of the world's copper supply. So I think there's a lot of slack Argentina can pick up if he just liberalizes it. It's so hard to mine anywhere that if he actually takes a real free market approach to mining in Argentina, there's a lot that could happen there. So there could be a mini, a mini mining boom in Argentina, maybe. I think there's reason for optimism there. The Argentine electorate has no hardcore position to mining in general. The big problem has been the capital controls because you earn, like, you want to sell your copper, you want to sell your gold or whatnot to the world, and then you have to sell the fake exchange rate that the government implements. And so, like, copper might be $4 a pound over in Chile, but, like, in Argentina, you were getting two-something after you paid the fake exchange rate. 
But actually, yeah, like the environmental regulations are not that bad. If, and then, like, the thing, like, Buenos Aires, like, around the capital is very liberal, and then the rest of the country is very conservative. And so, you like, you don't have indigenous groups, or, like, kind of the other, like, local yeah. opposition that holds up so many mining projects elsewhere in the world. Yeah, I think mining should do very well under him. Just yeah, but, but yeah, like if you look at the election results, like states like Cordova, Cordova kind of the western states that have yeah. mining, we're all like seventy five percent from a lot overwhelming blowout wins. All the yeah. resource states. So. There's so much too. It's the same. It's the I, same. It's the same strike line. Like it's the same copper as Chile, who's you know known for being this copper powerhouse, and like Argentina could do that too. They just because of the capital controls you mentioned, pretty much haven't. But oh. Uh, yeah, if you ever cross the border from from Argentina to Chile by land, I mean, you're just like driving through snow for like 50 kilometers, and then there's like a sign like, "Hey, you've arrived in Chile." Yeah, but you would never know. What I, I, mean, I I did that from Santiago to Mendoza, and it was the scariest bus ride of my yeah. life. I didn't like it at all, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you're just no. going up this S, like this S, and you're looking yeah. out over cliffs. And at one point, there's like a 200 foot drop, and there's just a rusted out bus. That fell off the cliff. You know, I got this. <laughs> I don't like this. But yeah, it's a wild drive. But so yeah, you... if you look at that topography, Argentina, yep, huge reserves. Like it should be just as well endowed as Chile. Yep. So what do you what do you think about Chile? It's one of the countries I have the hardest time with in, in Latin America. Because on the one hand, it's had all this good press for 20 years as being like the Switzerland of South America, stable you know, huge copper deposits, well endowed. There's a bunch of companies listed with ticker symbols right on the Santiago Stock Exchange. But I don't know. It just, I don't know. I never could get there with Chile's the least risky country in South America. It just never felt that way to me. So what do you think about Chile in general as like an investment destination? Yeah, uh, so I'll just say that it's one of the countries I've spent the least amount of time in. I think just a couple of weeks, where is I? Than most of these other places a lot longer. But yeah, my, my general view is they have strong institutions. They had Bachelet as president twice, who's a self avowed socialist, and she didn't really change anything in terms of the economy or the framework for investors. If they changed the constitution, which was on the ballot in what, 2020, 2021, if that had happened, that would have radically changed the overview. But those constitutional reforms were overwhelmingly rejected. What was it like 63, 37 or something? Yeah, I think Chile was what the poorest country in South America before Pinochet, like 1970s. Now it's the wealthiest country. And I think a lot of voters remember that and are thankful for the amount of progress they've made under kind of a right-wing framework. And I think, yeah, their institutions have held up very well. It's by far the best rule of law, best legal protections to land, to intellectual property, all that sort of stuff. Was, excluding countries like Uruguay that are very small, but of like the big investable countries. There's always political swings there, but I, I'd be more in the bucket of like Scandinavian countries where you'll have presidents okay. that are left wing, but there's no, no one's wanting to like change the underlying system. I think the difference, like like I said with Argentina, like you don't have the indigenous population, so you don't have the people that like reject modernity. Yeah, it's not like a country like Guatemala or Panama where you've just these people showing up from the, the countryside that are like, We're against all mining and right. burn it all yeah, down. Yeah. It's like that doesn't really exist in in sure. the southern cone. Yeah. So what do you think about their equity market then? Is do you look at I know there's ADRs. We talked about like the shrinking Chilean ADRs that some delist, but there's still a decent amount of them. So do you look at local tickers too or or just what's listed on U.S. exchanges? Yeah, I own the biggest bank, Bank of Chile, and I own CCU, which is the drinks, beer, and wine. Yeah, I don't have, I don't have a strong opinion for 2024 either. Probably if copper and lithium, like bear market lithium has been awful lately. Uh, but if some of that stuff comes back, probably that improves sentiment. I don't know how you get the green revolution without copper and lithium in much larger quantities. So Chile feels like a natural way to be long, long electric, not just electric vehicles, kind of the electrification of everything sort of thesis. It feels like the correct way to play it to me, but so far, I don't know. <laughs> it hasn't gotten much traction. I could be wrong. Silver too, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, the mining stocks have been brutal for me. So like I, I own them, I follow them, but 
I have a tough time with them. But like I own them for the same the same reasons. Like the long term thesis on the metals makes sense to me, but the shorter term on the actual mining stocks is brutal. So yeah, maybe Bank of Chile is a better way to play it instead of trying to to pick through crappy mining stocks. <laughs> I just like most of the Latin American banks, they pay large portions of their earnings out of dividends. And so at least like if the stock isn't going anywhere, which they haven't been for a long time, at least you're getting back a decent chunk of capital while you wait for something to happen. I think what Chilean banks are like a 7 or 8% dividend yield. So if the stock price remains flat, as it seems to usually do, <laughs> at least you get some returns. Right. Yeah, Chile interests me too. Because I feel like the drivers of their economy are kind of unique in, in South America. I think they're way more connected to China with their export market than That's true. most of it. Yeah. So I think they're kind of march a little more to the beat of their own drum than some of the other LATAM countries. Yeah, they've tried to play both sides of the US, China, like they wanted to be in TPP before that got killed, which was the kind of US specific free trade partnership. But then they're also like growing trade with China very quickly. So. Probably smart strategic ambiguity. Whereas a country like Colombia is like a hundred percent tied to the US. And so Yeah. Yeah. I mean Yeah, it was lately. Like since the pandemic, Mexico and Colombia, which have been on the US, have, have that's been the right bet. I think longer term you want to keep your options open. Yeah, I think that's one of the conversations around Argentina now too, is you know, where are they going to align themselves with the US or with China? But it'd be interesting to see. But anything else on Chile you think? is interesting to watch I, I guess i have down here like copper prices in china are basically what i'm looking for for chile in 2024 but is there anything else you think is noteworthy yeah i think that's probably right i know the next election so i think they he's got another 25 maybe that'd be interesting because yeah, never... i don't have a let's see i got it he was elected in 2021 so is it a four yeah, it should be 25. Then. Unless something dramatically changes, the Conservatives will win the oh next God. election there just because he's so unpopular. I was going to ask you, and Google answered my question, it's 2025 for the election, but we, we mentioned that they had tried to put a new constitution in, and I thought it was still ongoing, and it is. So on December 17th, they have another constitutional plebiscite. So, like, they've been voting on this thing and trying to get a new constitution through. So, like, yeah, that was kind of one of the things that when I say, like, I've always felt unsure about Chile. It's like they haven't had a constitution for, like, three years now. It's like it's just still up in the air. So it doesn't – I guess the institutions are stable. It's a good sign it hasn't – nothing crazy's happened and they're still doing plebiscites. But I, I just thought that was interesting. I know the right wing wrote the latest proposed one because they voted down the left wing one, and so now they've now they put up another one. But which, probably, which is kind of funny, right? Because I don't know if any of these are. Yeah, I don't know if any of these are ever going to get passed, or at some point they'll just give up and say, "Hey, we we'll stick with the Finnish uh, hero." My, un my understanding of what kind of happened was like the left wing came in; they thought they had this huge mandate, like the post COVID stuff, which was really just a vote yep. against the COVID regime. So they thought they were going to redo the constitution and make it, you know, a left wing constitution. And then it just turns out in the vote that the right wing is just going to make the constitution even more right wing. But we'll see. Yeah, because they put up a left wing win, which would have guaranteed a lot of like social welfare programs would have given uh, a lot of rights to indigenous people in terms of blocking natural resource production and a lot of very aggressively left-wing stuff and then people saw the the actual text of that and were like ah, this is this is way too far right right so you're close to panama do you do you follow it at all i know they were big in the news on mining closure pretty recently have you followed panama at all uh, yeah, I, I pay attention to it. I mean, there aren't many Panamanian stocks to invest in, but I have bought just over the past month, I bought Franco Nevada, which is a gold royalty mm -hmm. streaming company, because they had, what, they get 20% of their production from that mine that's now in limbo in Panama. And I believe their stock's down 30%, which probably a bit of an overreaction for a royalty model mining company, when I doubt that they lose that much long term. My understanding is now that that mine will go to international jurisdiction and Panama doesn't have any sort of case. This is just kind of 
ridiculously right. arbitrary what they did. And so I'd assume Panama either lets them reopen the mine after their presidential elections, which are, I believe, in April of 2024. And if not, then it goes to arbitration and the mine would reopen or they'd get a multi-billion dollar payout at that point, which Franco Nevada would be compensated. So yeah, I think that's interesting. I mean, what, you had gold hit new all-time highs, what, yeah. a couple of weeks ago, I think? Uh, Franco Nevada is trading at 52 weeks lows. Like, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, and they're... I don't, they're I don't have strong views about Panama, the country, aside from that uh, Bocas del Toro is really nice for tourism. <laughs> that's, my, that's my one strong view about Panama. The thing I thought was so interesting, though, is when I think about, like, people always talk about jurisdictional risk in Latin America, and, like, Panama would have been up there on the list of like the safest places foreign investors would think of. Like they would never have expected out of nowhere Panama's biggest copper mine to get expropriated. And like at the same time, I own the largest gold miner in Nicaragua. And that has been running smoothly for the years I've owned it. Like they just actually bought a Canadian project, like a major Canadian project with profits from their Nicaragua mine. And I don't know. It's just, it was interesting to see that happen in Panama. Compared to you know places other investors might have expected it, and the heritage economic what is it the heritage economic freedom or economic liberty or whatever index Panama usually ranks in the middle tier of countries like around Mexico, Peru, and Colombia, which would mean yeah, it was pretty surprising what they did, but it wasn't like up in Uruguay, Chile, like the, yeah. the top tier of LATAM countries either. But I think maybe the, the strength of their banking industry gave people a sense that the country was safer than it really was. Like, why would people do all that offshore banking and all that there, right? But I mean, like when you actually looked at like like their legal system and their investor protections and all, it's like on par with Colombia, which fine. I mean, Colombia is investable, Panama is investable, but yeah. it's not a... Fair that's what you're into. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. So yeah, what else? Are you following? I guess I, I want to ask you about Venezuela in general because like I travel to Colombia a lot, not since the pandemic, but I've spent months living there. And one of the things I noticed is how big of an impact the Venezuela crisis has there. I mean, like I think mm-hmm. I, I don't remember the numbers offhand, but the majority of refugees from Venezuela are in Colombia, right? So it has a huge impact on, on the society and. The economy. So, what's going on in Venezuela from from your perspective? I know the recent headline is um, uh, the, the oil wars and everything, but talk about that. But like just in general, like what what's going on in Venezuela? Yeah, you're you're right. I was just going to comment that there's an estimated two and a half million Venezuelan migrants, refugees in Colombia, and the entirety of Venezuela is thirty million people. So that's like seven eight percent of the whole country is living in Colombia. When we're not exactly like a super wealthy country, it's, it's caused us a lot of problems in terms of straining our healthcare system, our education. Our government has tried to treat them well, but obviously it's a big strain. Uh, yeah, people haven't really given it much attention. It seemed like their government was losing power kind of up through the pandemic. There'd been more and more signs of distress in terms of them struggling to even keep their military funded and their soldiers paid. But unfortunately, I think I think their government has gotten a second a second wind since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Kind of the U.S. and other countries had to go looking for other sources of oil, and so they've kind of lifted or they've weakened some of the the uh, embargoes. Some money's been coming into Venezuela. Um, yeah, I have no idea what will happen with Guyana. That's that's why I'm scared of a land war next door. If there is a change in government in Venezuela, I think that'd be very good news for Colombian equities. There's a couple of companies that have or had maybe past tense businesses in Venezuela, like Coca-Cola, FEMSA, which is the Coke bottle yeah. uh, Mexican company, but they own the license for all of Venezuela. So it'll be 30 million new drinkers that come back online like day one as soon as there's a capitalist uh, economy there again. And I, th- I think there's a few opportunities like that, that if Venezuela ever reopens to business, can make some money. But it hasn't reopened yet, right? Like I've seen headlines of people saying like, oh, buy real estate in Venezuela now. But are we there yet or no? As Americans, we're certainly not there yet because like their customs, people are robbing Americans across the border. I understand some Europeans have been traveling over there and some people seem to be having a good time and some not so much. But I think you have to wait for 
I think the time to go is like in the six to 12 months when there's a new government or the transition to a new government's been announced. Okay. I've run into some wealthy Venezuelan people here in Colombia and they're all still either in Colombia or they're in the US. Like nobody's gone back to Venezuela yet. I'm with. Yeah. Like the people that actually own like houses and have have claims on assets, they're, they're still in exile. Yeah. And then the oil, the oil headlines are, I don't know, I, I kind of find them ridiculous. Like, I don't know what the angle is and like why Venezuela is doing that now. But the idea that they're going to go and develop these super complicated and expensive offshore pre-salt stuff in Guyana, like they're having struggles with toilet paper. Like, I just don't see how Venezuela <laughs> is going to be able to, to use these oil assets, even if they take control of them. Because the actual Guyana is just a jungle. Right, like there's nothing onshore that they really want. It's the offshore oil assets. Yeah, that's right. They think that owning Western Guiana will give them the control over the offshore asset. Maybe try to force like Exxon and the other developers there to play ball with them. But I, I don't see the West going for that. I think the U.S. just sends some naval ships off the shore of Caracas and tells them to to get lost. Like I mean, if it actually became a serious thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I don't think Exxon squanders. Uh, well, Exxon's invested like twenty billion dollars, some absurd amount in Guyana already. I don't think they're just going to let that <laughs> disappear to right. a, yeah. a and Brazil, dictator. And Brazil has huge claims too, like Petrobras. They they don't want it to turn into some wild west pirate show, right? Like yeah. they'd rather be developing next Exxon and Shell and and make it a real oil region. But yeah, you mentioned expropriation too. One of my favorite disclosures is in the Gruma the the mexican tortilla manufacturer because their venezuelan operations actually got expropriated and they have like an ongoing court battle for like 10 years going on with like these spanish treaties that they're invoking from like 100 years ago to try and get the assets back and it's just interesting talking about like the panama situation like it's the only disclosure like the actual ongoing expropriation story i can think of as a point of reference and yeah it's been going on for like 10 years so i guess to your franco nevada point like yeah they might be getting paid billions of dollars but like i don't think panama is going to be paying up anytime soon so that's like a super long-term call option i would say i think the difference with panama would be that they're a country that participates in the global capital system and in fact if they want to keep collecting on the canal revenues they can't really ignore judgments from, from international courts uh, yeah true. i think that's the difference like venezuela has been Venezuela has been, there's been judgments against them, like, what was it, Crystal X, one of the gold companies there, had a judgment and they just were never able to collect on it. But I think Panama yeah, would it's true. would pay, because they that's true too. the canal business is too important. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, Venezuela really, you're right, they lost the case to Gruma, I think, if I have memory serves, and they're just like, nah, like, we're not going to pay you. I believe you mentioned toilet paper, the Kimberly Clark, Mexico, has the Venezuelan operations, and they just gave up as well. So there's probably a legal case where you're just like, okay, so we sue them for years, and then if we win, then what? <laughs> it doesn't matter because they won't pay. So. Yeah. So how do you like? How do you think about jurisdictional risk in Latin America, in general? Like, how do you actually like handicap the countries, or do you just look at like what your investment universe is that you can actually invest in, and then go issue by issue? Like, I'm curious. Do you do you like? Handicap, oh, Mexico is 5% less risky than, than Colombia and adjust your valuations, or, or do you do it equity by equity? I think I would say I think more in terms of industry, like I'd be much more comfortable owning a consumer staples or a financial or something than I would be like a resource company. And then like if it's a sector where I have less confidence, like in like the security of the asset, then then I would spend more time handicapping the politics. Uh, yeah, I think there's kind of the countries that have been more stable that that you assign lower risk to, and then you've got the countries like Argentina that are constantly in a state of flux, and there you have to pay really low valuations, starting valuations to to think that it's going to turn out well. But yeah, and people seem to view, often they view it as just like a binary, like, oh, it's a left-wing government, so it's uninvestable, or oh, it's a right-wing government, so they're going to treat me well. And it really is not that simple. Like I mentioned, like in Mexico, like the right-wing governments were not good for capital for the past 
15 years. It wasn't that their policies were wrong. It's, they were just ineffectual. They didn't get anything done. People weren't moving businesses to Mexico at a speed like we might have expected. And then you've got like this populist, like weirdo left wing and West winger in AMLA. But he's out there, like he goes to the ribbon cuttings for the new factories. He's always like trying to get people to, to build stuff there. It's like, he, if you were just looking at it on a political uh, left, right, whatever the axis, you would say, oh, he's worse for the investments than right, than the right. previous guys. Yeah. And you apply more more context to it. But yeah, sector by sector. Yeah, and if you're in a country with worse protections on assets, then maybe stick to the companies that are less likely to to be a political football. Cool. So yeah, I, we covered a lot of ground. Is there any other big event or something you're expecting in 2024 related to Latin America that you think we didn't cover? I'd just say broadly, I think at some point we might get picked up like um, just a factor sort of bet. You might see money start coming in uh, just because these markets have underperformed for so long now. Value, starting valuations are so low, but then once they start going up, I think you see a lot of momentum investors come in, a lot of people that haven't looked at these names in 15 years and say, oh, wow, these are actually like pretty good businesses at really good prices. Uh, like Mexico in particular, the market's up what, 150% now off the COVID loss. And so people, I've like half of my Twitter feed, like the of the people that actually follow Latin America, half of people are like, this is a bubble, it's way too expensive. And then people like me are like, but the prices are still below 2013. Like, how is this a bubble? But people are like, but it's already up 150%. But, but then you ask yourself, well, could this go up 300%? Could this go up 500%? All these markets went up 500%, like in 2002 yeah. to 2008. Like, all these markets went way, way up. And so, it, Oh, Mexico's up 150%. It must be getting overbought. It's like, how much capital out there in the world? Like, Mexico's like the 30th largest uh, market in the world by market cap. And so if you go from Mexico being the 30th largest to the 20th largest market in the world by market cap, like, how much do valuations have to go up? You yeah. Start writing some pretty interesting math. And so I just say people should embrace the idea that possibly Latin America gets hot again. And I can't really tell you what the specific catalyst would be. So it's not going to be China or a commodity super cycle like the 2003 bull market was, but at some point money will come back because people always always go exploring cheap stuff on a long enough time horizon. And I, th I do think a lot has changed with inflation with things since the pandemic, obviously supply chains in Mexico in particular. People should just embrace the idea that Latin America could be set for a good decade. Yeah, I think especially in Brazil and Mexico, which are the two bigger equity markets and better demographically, I mean, larger populations, there's a financial marketing deepening domestically too, right? There's just more and more local investors that are becoming, you know, from lower middle class to middle class in their country. And they incrementally have a little bit more to invest and they put those in the domestic markets too. So I think if you get that coupled with real foreign capital inflows and then... Yeah, I agree with you. I think you could see multiples of of where we are now. I have a hard time seeing like the short case. You know, I can understand the investors that forget it. I don't understand Latin America. I'm going to be under allocated or I'm just not going to allocate. But I, I, I'm i trying to think through before we were talking, like what would be like a short case? Why would I want to short, actively short, you know, Mexico or, or Colombia or Brazil in 2024? And I, I you know, short of like, Total commodity price destruction, like oil back down to like 50 a barrel and agricultural commodities roll over, like that would do it. But I don't have that view. So I don't know. If you were to steel man like the short Latin American 2024 case, what would it be? Yeah, I, think, I do think it's still driven by commodity prices. And so if you have a global recession, which China's economy is a real mess right now. A lot of Europe's not so good. So the US is outperforming, but a lot of the other global markets are pretty weak. And if you had something unexpected that caused like a capitulation in commodities, like say Russia and Ukraine made a peace deal, and so all those commodities from Russia come back in the market, I think that might be how you got paid on a short bet on emerging markets and on Latin America in particular. Is that my baseline view? No, not at all. Uh, that would be one argument. And then... I think people always have a negative view on politics. I don't think that's really justified in our region right now, given Argentina just voted for 
a libertarian kind of far right sort of guy. Colombia's regional elections were very positive for conservatives. Uh, the elections in Paraguay were very positive. Like, so conservatives have been stacking up wins locally in 2023, but people had a different view on politics. Maybe people just see the headlines from Panama and think the worst about other countries. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. Well, Ian, this was awesome. I could talk to you for hours, so we'll have to do it again sometime. But where can people find you on the internet, follow your, your newsletter and your work? Give them a send off. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me on. This has been fun. Hope people enjoy it, learn something. I'm at Ian's Insider Corner on either Substack or Seeking Alpha and on Twitter, IRBZEK, B E Z E K. And I will link all that stuff in the show notes and make sure you guys can find Ian. Thanks, man. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Till next time.